In this Fundamentals of Texturing exercise video, we're going to be taking a look at how to unwrap and hand paint a texture for this low poly axe. Before we begin painting anything though, we need to unwrap our object first. Now we could use a number of automatic unwrapping techniques like Smart UV Project, but this has a couple downsides. First of all, we're not making the best use of texture space. There's lots of space in between these that's just being completely wasted, and since we're only working with an image size of 512 by 512, we need to make the best use of that space that we possibly can. The second issue is that it's really not intuitive which piece goes where. Uh, we want to be able to immediately recognize what it is that we're actually painting on. So we're going to be doing this a little bit more manually, and it's going to give us a lot better result in the long run. Now, for this axe head, we can just project this from view. So what I'm going to do is just press Control L to select everything that's connected to the section and hit U and project from view. And so that'll give us a good starting point for this. However, if we started painting on this, uh, this top piece and this back piece and bottom piece are all going to be stretched across and we don't want that at all. So we can unwrap those areas separately. I can just select this bottom section here, hit U and unwrap. I can do the same for this back section, U and unwrap, and also for this top section. Now for this main handle part, it should be pretty simple. However, it's really long and I don't want it to be stretched across the entire image. So what I'm going to do is just with edge select mode, um, put a seam right here in the middle of the handle. Oh, and I'm also going to put a seam right down the middle. So just alt select this edge right here and that'll select the entire loop around. So I can mark that as a seam as well. And if I press control L, U and unwrap, we now see that we get a nice unwrap. So this is pretty good, but one thing that we can do is mirror the right side and the left side since they're going to be exactly the same anyway. So we can just overlay the UVs on top of each other. For this bottom portion here, I can just press Control L to select everything that's connected. And then to mirror it, press Control M and then the Y for the Y axis. And then just move it down and snap it to this one. Uh, it looks like it doesn't want to snap. Let's change the snapping to vertex hold down control to snap. And if there are any stray points like this that just aren't snapping, generally I'll just turn on snapping really quick and go through and do it all manually. It definitely does take some time. However, it'll give us a very clean result. All right, now I'm going to do the exact same for the bottom piece. So control L, control M and Y to flip it on the Y axis, move it down so it roughly matches and then turn on snapping, and then just snap all the vertices together. Alright, so now that we have all of the pieces of the puzzle together, we can arrange them in a way that makes the most use of our space. Now, we know that we want the biggest piece to probably be the axe head, since it's going to be the most visually interesting. So let's make sure that we do that just by box selecting so we make sure we select both pieces that are overlapping, pressing control L and then scaling that up. Oh, we can turn off snapping so it doesn't jump like that. And I'm going to put it right over here. Now for this bottom portion of the axe, I can just select that again with control L um, and I'll lay this across the top, maybe something like that. Now these tiny pieces aren't quite as important so I'm just going to scale them down and put them out of the way for now while we arrange the big pieces because we want to make the obvious decisions first and that would be with the big and important pieces. So let's just move these around until we have something that fits. Now one thing to keep in mind while we're unwrapping is the amount of space that we'll need between the UVs. Modern game engines use a technique to minimize memory usage called MIP mapping where a texture is downsampled depending on how far away from the camera it is. If we only paint at the edge of the UVs and no further, we'll get these nasty edges as the image is scaled to something other than the original resolution. But we can get a clean result by painting a little extra outside of the UVs. So forget what your first grade teacher told you and paint outside the lines when texturing. A good rule of thumb is to take whatever resolution you're working at and divide it by 128. So since we're working with 512 by 512, we're going to need at least four pixels of padding. So we just need to unwrap in such a way that we have enough room to do that.
So here we have our layout. Let's go ahead and save the file before we start texture painting. Now that we're ready to paint, let's switch from edit mode to texture paint mode. Immediately we can see that we're missing a texture because of the bright pink color that's overlaid on the model. So up here at the top, it says we have missing data and that we're missing a texture slot, but we can easily add a texture slot by clicking add a paint slot, selecting diffuse color and creating a new image. I'll just call this one axe color and I'll set the width and the height to be 512 by 512. I'll also change the color to be more of a neutral gray so that we can see our colors more clearly. Now I'll click OK, and we're ready to start painting on our model. Now in the UV image editor, we just need to make sure we have that image selected. And now as we paint on a model, we'll see that update there on the left. Now if we want to paint in the 2D view as well as the 3D view, we can do that just by switching the UV image editor from view to paint. And that way we can either paint in the 2D or 3D views, depending on which one's more convenient for us. Now before we dive into painting, there are a couple tools and techniques that I want to show you that I'll be using throughout this video. The first is face selection masking, and you can find that right in the 3D view header next to the pivot point options. With that selected, we can right click to select a face, and when we paint on that face, it's going to paint only there, and we don't have to worry about it spilling over to the other faces around it. We can also use the B key to box select faces, or use Ctrl L to select everything that's linked to those faces. We can also use the A key to toggle selection for all of the faces at one time. Now in the Options tab, we have a couple really important things under Project Paint. The first one is Occlude, and what that's going to do is allow us to only paint on the faces that are directly under the mouse. So if I move this around and I start painting on this axe, we can see that I've painted here on the back, but it's completely blocked the paint from going on this side of the axe as well because this face on the right is in front of it. However, if I uncheck Occlude and I paint that again, then you can see that we're now painting on both faces. Cull, the option below that, blocks us from painting on the back side of faces so that we don't accidentally paint directly through the mesh. However, sometimes that might be helpful. So if you want, you can uncheck this and then if you paint, we're going to be painting over the entire mesh and painting all the way through to the other side. Now we didn't hit every spot because normal is still checked on and that limits what we can paint by the angle it's facing the camera. So if I'm painting at this extreme angle, it's going to ignore us right where it hits an 80 degree mark. However, if I uncheck this, then I can paint wherever I'd like. This option can be really helpful to have on if you're painting on an edge and you don't want it to spill over to the other side. So all three of these options can be very handy to have on, however sometimes they might result in jagged edges, so you have to be aware of what they do so you can use them when appropriate. Now the last option that I want to show you is bleed, and this is a really really helpful one. Remember when I was laying out the UVs, I mentioned that we want to have at least 4 pixels of padding. Bleed will automatically give us this padding when we're painting over seams. So right now it's set to 2 pixels, but let's go ahead and bump this up to 6 just to give, you know, 2 extra to our 4 that we need. And if we paint along a seam, we can see that it's already giving us this extra 6 pixels of padding around the edges. And so it's really good to enable this right off the bat so we don't have to worry about it later. Now back up in the Tools tab, there are a couple things I want to talk about when it comes to mixing colors. First of all, you can see I have a color palette right here that I can just select a few different colors from. And you may not have that by default, so I'll just go ahead and clear the palette that we have now. And you can add a new one at any time just by clicking New. Now that'll generate these plus and minus buttons right here. And if we click plus, it'll save that color as a selection. Then we can change the color to be whatever we'd like, click plus, and it'll add a new one to the palette. Clicking minus will remove it. Now just like in Photoshop, we can quickly switch between foreground and background colors by clicking the X key. So if we're painting our blue foreground color and we'd like to switch to the brown, we can just click X and it'll switch between those. I can also sample a color really quickly just by pressing the S key while hovering over whichever color I'd like to pick. So that'll make it the active foreground color and I can quickly add it to the palette just by clicking this plus button. So by utilizing the color palette combined with the X key to switch between foreground and background colors and also the S key to pick, we can really quickly blend our colors. And just as a quick refresher, don't forget that you can switch your brush size by just clicking F and scaling up and down, and you can change the brush strength really quickly by pressing Shift F and scaling up and down as well. So with those tools and techniques in mind, let's go ahead and get started. Now the first thing I want to do is block out the basic colors for this, 
instead of just going in and you know painting over it just like this, I want to fill in the colors, especially with the gradient, which will make things a lot easier. However, there's no fill brush here by default, but we can add a new one just by clicking this plus button, and I'm going to call this fill. And down in the brush options, I'm going to switch the image paint tool from draw to fill. And that'll give us this fill brush, and so we can just click and fill the texture. Now we can also use gradient. I'll just undo that. And that'll give us a gradient that we can use to give this a bit nicer of a feel. Now I'm going to use this in combination with the face selection mode. I'll just select the entire handle area and I'll go from black to a more woody brown. Something like that. And I can just drag a gradient from the bottom to the top. Let's turn the strength all the way up. Maybe I don't want it pure black at the bottom, so let's start ways down. And something like that is looking pretty good. Now I also want to do this for the axe handle, so I'll just select portion of that and press Control L to select everything that's linked. And this time, instead of going from dark to light, I just want to fade the colors of the metal and do a hue shift instead of a value shift. So maybe towards the edge, it's more of a warmer color as it's been chipped away, um, but maybe near the end, it's more of a, a cool color. But now instead of using this as a linear gradient, uh, let's use a radial gradient so it'll go you know around in a circle and we can pull this outwards from the center of the axe so now that we have our base colors into play i'll switch back over to our regular brush to fill in some basic shading to start out i'm going to darken the crevices of the handle with a large soft brush this breaks up the flat shading even more and helps to emphasize the overall structure of the axe when seen from a distance if I need to lighten an area, I can easily color pick with the S key, increase the value a bit, and paint over that spot again. The little pointing finger icon next to the radius and strength settings enables pressure sensitivity. I have it on for strength so that I can easily control how much I want the colors to blend together. Here I'm adding more shading to the head of the axe. I'm darkening the area near where it attaches to the handle where grime or dirt is more likely to be built up. I'm also pushing the blues forward a bit so that the edge of the axe stands out more in contrast, which makes it look a little bit more sharp. Let's also add a thin outline to the edges to make them look worn down. This also shows off the form of the axe from a distance and helps the shape to read very clearly. At this stage, I'm working very loose and fast and I'm not concerned about clean lines at all. Since my goal is to give this a hammered metal look with lots of dents in the surface, this type of gestural and somewhat messy approach actually helps to lay the foundation for that texture that we'll add later on. For these edges, I've set the strength all the way up to 1 so that the seams are completely hidden. I'm also frequently switching between the 2D and 3D views to paint, depending on whatever feels more efficient in the moment. Now, even though the head of the axe is actually completely flat, I'm painting an inset face near the edges. The shape will help the axe look more detailed and stylized, but without using any extra polygons. To help the shape appear more three-dimensional, I'll fake the lighting on it by darkening the underside and highlighting the top. Now that we have a good base to work with, let's go through and thin out the edges a bit to make them appear less bold and more weathered. Oh, and don't forget to save your image. Saving the file does not save the texture, so be sure to go to Image Save As in the UV Image Editor to save your work. For more info about working with textures and other external assets, be sure to check out our Intro to Blender data course as well. So right now I'm continuing to thin out the white and define the shading around the edges. I'm frequently sampling the color with the S key from a nearby area so that the colors continue to blend together in a natural way. The most important thing to note though is that we've started really big with just gradients and are gradually working our way smaller and smaller into the details. Whenever you work on a project like this, you always want to start with the big picture and get that nailed down first before moving on. When a builder builds a house, they start with the foundation, then they add the frame, and the walls, and finally the trim last. With that exact same mindset, we've set our foundational colors, we've blocked out the structure by shadowing the crevices and highlighting the edges. This allows us to build up our texture more naturally, and as a result the details start to fill themselves in as we go along with our loose and gestural strokes. Here I'm just continuing to blend the transition between the warm and cool colors. I'm also using a soft brush to add a little bit of that warm color to the edges to continue that weathered look. Before we get too distracted with the details of the axe head, let's switch over and work on the part that connects it to the handle. 
I'm using the same process of starting with the gradient and adding in shadows to help define the form as I did for the rest of the axe. I like to make things in pieces of three, so I decided to give this piece a new material rather than use the same material as the axe head or the wood of the handle. Because it's at the place where the other two materials meet, I wanted to make it noticeably darker so that it stands out in contrast to both. This creates a sort of interesting visual handshake where the head and the handle meet, which really helps to tie the object together as a whole and makes the connection between the parts appear more sturdy. Alright, so now that the head is blocked out, let's move on to texturing the handle. I've enabled smooth stroke in the paint stroke options so that I can easily get these long flowing lines. I'm using really subtle colors here, but by painting line after line on top of each other and layering these strokes, a natural wood pattern starts to appear. I started out using darker colors, but after a while it got too dark so I switched to a lighter color and started laying those on top as well to balance things out. You can see I got into a little bit of trouble here because I was painting in the 2D view and forgot that the seams wouldn't quite line up. I know I'm going to put a carved pattern here later, so I'm not too worried about it, but I'm spending the time to clean it up just in case. With that done, it's finally time to do some detailing. I've noticed that a lot of hand-painted weapons textures have this really awesome hammered metal look, and I wanted to emulate that here. To do that, I'm laying down this Voronoi-type pattern, which is going to end up being a guideline for that texture. We're not going to see these lines too much in the end anyway, so go ahead and keep things fast and loose. Don't be too concerned about super clean lines or getting everything the perfect shape or the perfect size. Now with that pattern in place, I'm going to go ahead and fill in some of these shapes with slightly darker or slightly lighter colors. As long as we keep the effect subtle enough, it'll give us that awesomely handcrafted and hammered feel we were after. It starts to really add some character to the otherwise pretty lifeless object. I'm filling in some of these smaller shapes, but also covering up the lines in other areas to make even larger shapes so that we have a nice variety. The main thing I'm trying to fight against here is the texture looking flat. I'm adding a really subtle amount of darker colors underneath the white lines in some of these areas so that it appears that these shapes are divots in the surface. I'll also occasionally switch to using a really large and soft brush if I feel like the surface needs a little more overall variation. I'm just going to be using these same techniques that we've already talked about from here on out, so to save you from listening to me repeat the same things over and over again, the rest of this video is just going to be time lapse with a couple interjections at important points. We already have a good base for the wood texture from the long flowing lines that we drew earlier, so now all we need to do is use a big brush to create an overall pattern, and then after that a smaller, harder brush to accentuate the lines that we already have. I've set my blending mode to multiply here so that I'm altering the value and hue without flattening it out again. To lighten things up later, I'll use screen.
Creating these dings and scratches turned out to be easier than I thought, but made a huge difference in the style of the axe. Start with a dark shape where the indent would be angled downwards, and then underline it with a bright color where the light would catch the lip of it angled upwards. It really helps to add areas where the metal was flaking away a bit as well. For that effect, I outlined a shape along the underlying Voronoi pattern and then filled in that shape with a color darker than the surrounding area. Breaking up this smooth edge here really helped sell the weathered look since it appears to add yet another three dimensional layer to what is still just a flat surface. To create these carved lines, I switched my stroke method to line under the paint stroke settings in the toolbar. Just be careful you have the corners of the diamonds meet at the very edges so that it will still look like a repeated pattern when mirrored onto the other side.
And there we have it, a hand painted axe. I'm excited to see the results of what you guys came up with for this exercise, so don't forget to submit your model when you're done to show off all your hard work.